the problem with human milk research is that whenever it's reported in the literature or wherever it's reported in, like, say, the hospital, it's being reported as any human milk. So that is that's what that means is that if you're getting fresh milk at the breast, if you are getting freshly pumped milk in a tube, if you are getting refrigerated milk, if you are getting frozen milk, if you're getting pasteurized um, donor human milk, um, if you are wherever you are in the spectrum of milk, like as you can see, those types of milk all vary in like what they're going to have in them of potentially the bioactive components in them. It's never broken down like that in any of the research. Hmm. So that's, and it's a huge, like it's, it would be a huge undertaking to change that into like the governmental databases and to hospital databases to really tease that out. Welcome to the Clinical Appraisal Podcast. My name is Ian Lane, and on this show, we discuss the science and theory of nursing. I'm a critical care nurse and PhD student in nursing science focused on measurement and methodology. Importantly, nothing I say constitutes nursing advice. This is education only. And if you want to get in touch with me, please email me at clinicalappraisal at gmail.com. If you want to donate to the show, links are in the description. And otherwise, like, comment, subscribe, and share the show if you enjoyed this episode. Hi, everybody. So today I'm here with Dr. Carrie Ellen Breer. Um, Why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself to the listeners and tell us who you are, what you're interested in, and we'll go from there. Yeah. Hi. Um, thanks so much for having me. So my name is Carrie Ellen. I am currently an assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, I am in my seventh seventh year, I want to say. I started in 2017. So hopefully I'm doing the math there. <laughs> They're right. <laughs> um, I just um, actually I'm in the tenure process right now. So my tenure application is under review. Um, but I am also, in addition to being a faculty member, I am a per diem nurse scientist at Connecticut Children's. I uh, work mostly at up at UMass Amherst where I do my research and teach and um, help out some of the nurses at Connecticut Children's with their research and evidence-based practice, practice projects. So interestingly, I met you at, so I go to school at uh, University of Massachusetts Worcester campus. Um, and even though I met you through the UMass system, I also work at Connecticut Children's. Mm -hmm. Um, For everybody listening, of course, nothing that we say represents either institution. This is all just our personal interests and our um, interests in nursing research. But, uh, But it was interesting to me that I met you through one venue and actually have a connection to you through a different venue. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I actually, before I came to my faculty position, I worked as a clinical nurse and in a couple of different roles at the Children's Hospital. So that's where my background is in the clinical. I worked in the neonatal intensive care unit, um, both during nursing school as a patient care associate. And then I moved into a clinical nurse position there um, where I worked at kind of get Children's for 10 years before I became a professor. So that's my, and then I came back. I had left to go and then I came back in the last couple of years because the opportunity came that I could work per diem um, and do a little bit of that role, which I I love being in both places. That's wonderful. Are you still working per diem in the NICU? I don't work per diem in the NICU clinically, but I'm working per diem at Connecticut Children's in the Department of Nursing Research or in the Institute for Nursing Research um, Um, and evidence-based practice. Yeah. So it's in a, the projects that I'm supporting are in the NICU focus, but also not, but the NICU is where I love. So yeah. Great. Um, So we'll talk a little bit about your research interests and kind of what you're doing specifically. But before we do, I think it would be interesting to start with what made you choose nursing and then what ended up making you interested in uh, neonatal nursing. Yeah, so I actually I feel like mine's a little backwards in the sense that I didn't know I wanted to be a nurse. I knew that I wanted to work in the neonatal intensive care unit. Hmm. Um, I knew I wanted to work with babies and I feel like I just, my senior year of high school, I did this internship where I was with a OBGYN and got experience on that area, kind of seeing the medical world from that side and got to shadow in the NICU because they had, they knew that was my interest. Um, And I had a lot of experience and exposure to nurses during that time in that internship. And I just kind of said, you know what? Nursing sounds good. I don't want to go to medical school. I don't want to be in school for However many years physicians need to go to school, which is really funny looking back, right? Because now I've spent more time in school and still kind of am in school. Um, But that's kind of what led me into nursing. And I feel like it's funny. I just kind of happened into nursing, but I really feel like it's 
definitely the right place that I, it was the right decision. I'm so glad I'm here. Like I identify with nursing so much. Um, so it's funny how those little decisions when you're 17 years old can kind of put you on a trajectory that you would never really imagine. What is it that resonated with you after you became a nurse about um, nursing in general? I love the connection with families. I think that's something with nursing you really can't, it's it's hard, right? Like in, there's so many different professions within healthcare. And I just feel like being at the bedside, working with families and my specialty with babies and their families, like I really love that. Um, I love the patients, but I also had some experiences working with adult patients while in nursing school um, outside of clinical and in a PCA role also. And I just, there's something about babies. <laughs> I've always wanted to work with babies, but it's the families and like teaching families and giving them that hope that, you know, this really sick baby, this really um, immature baby is going to grow and develop and, and be healthy and working with the families. That's, that's what I really really love about the nursing is you have that time um, and that perspective, kind of you have the biological perspective, but then also the person, you know, the person to person connection as well. Definitely. I'm interested by the fact that you said, and correct me if I got this wrong, but you did 10 years at the bedside before you went back for your graduate training. Did I get that so right? So I will no. So 10 years before I became a faculty member. Oh, I see. Kind yeah. of the, the interim in this whole process, this long trajectory you've had is what you're yeah. alluding yeah. to. I see. So um, how long were you practicing before you went back to grad school? Or was it a pretty short turnaround time for you? Did you always know you wanted to do some kind of uh, advancement of your practice or your knowledge development? So when I was, a, well, when I was in nursing school, I was in the honors program at UConn. Um, and I had exposure to research in that sense. And was really interested. In. I liked it. My senior year is kind of trying to figure out, you know, what I wanted to do next. Um, my now husband, who was my boyfriend at the time, was a little bit older than me, and he was doing his PhD already. Um, so when I was getting ready to think about graduating, my advisor kind of mentioned it to me. She said, you know, Carolyn, you really should think about research. I think this is something that you would, you know, do really well in. So why don't you apply for the bachelor's to PhD program for after you graduate? You can start to take some classes this year in your senior year uh, and then kind of be ahead of the game, right, moving into that. And at the time, I was like, okay, you know, that sounds good. I, I want to get my PhD study done now. Um, you know, my husband's doing it, well, boyfriend at the time, but um, I, I didn't have kids. I, I knew that for me at the time, if I just kept going with schooling, it felt like the right choice. Um, so I decided to apply for the PhD program. I went in not knowing what I wanted to do with research. I feel like I was this little fledgling, like just there because I was there and I learned so much over the years and have continued to grow. But that's a conversation I love to have with PhD students is when they don't know what they want to do right away, because some people go in and definitely know what they want and some people don't. And I don't think there's any right or way wrong, right or wrong way. It's just a different path and it's going to give you different opportunities. Um, so that's how I kind of fell into the PhD program. Um, I graduated and I started working full time as a nurse and did the PhD program part time to begin with just so that I could manage both full time clinical work and um, the PhD program as well. That's wonderful. I do feel like there is... Um a cadre of us at the PhD student level who don't know what they want and then they get down on themselves for it. Mm -hmm. But you're a prime example of somebody who didn't at first know and then grew their program of research into its own kind of enterprise um, yeah. from there. So I think that will be uh, heartening for some folks to hear. Um, yeah, I don't actually think it's the majority of people who do know what they want right away either. Like, I think people have this idea that they're going to, that they should know right away. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that's actually the minority of people. Yeah, that, it's funny you say that because I feel like when I was in it, I felt like the minority, right? Of like the person that didn't know because I also was, what, 22 years old, right? Mm -hmm. I just, all of my... um like the cohort members for so most of them were very experienced nurses who had a very clear like clinical picture of what they wanted and of research. Um, so I don't know, it feels like, like you said, like you're alone in it, but maybe you, it really is the majority of people that don't know what they want. So I am also, <clears throat> yeah, I am also coming from a, the perspective of, uh, I guess. So I actually started a different PhD program and then became a nurse and kind of went from PhD program to PhD program Oh, okay. with my trajectory. Yeah, I did okay. a psychology and neuroscience first for undergrad and yeah, then neat. started a psychology PhD where I focused on behavioral uh, statistics and neuroscience. And then 
I started to ask clinical questions. I got more involved in like, you know, clinical based research. And I thought, well, with postdoc, this is going to be pretty much the length of med school, if not a little bit longer, depending mm-hmm. on the, the path. Right. And um, so I started to look into it. My husband's a nurse. And so we talked about it and he was like, well, if you're going to do it, you should do it now. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but in, in sort of a more typical fields where people don't work clinically for a while first, mm-hmm. I do think it's the vast majority of people who don't necessarily know what they want to do when they come in mm-hmm. or they have some idea that evolves significantly after they start. Mm-hmm. But you make a good point about clinical nurses, especially those who've worked for a long time when they start, usually they, at least they know like the content area that they want to yeah. specialize their research in. Um, yeah. So do you, did you continue your dissertation work and is that kind of what you're doing now? Tell us a little bit about what you're interested in and how it kind of evolved from your dissertation work. Yeah. So my, um, dissertation work was looking at direct breastfeeding in the NICU. So with premature babies, for those who are listening and don't know, you know, what the NICU is necessarily, um, we have babies that are born really early um, or are sick. They're their baby term and they're just very sick babies. So a lot of times what happens is they're either too ill or they're too immature, immature that they can't feed orally. So they can't take a bottle. They can't feed at the breast. Um, so what's happening is if they're getting human milk feeding, their parent is pumping milk um, and then we're feeding it through the feeding tube. And eventually as they get you know more well and as they grow and they can coordinate the swallowing and sucking and breathing at the same time, which is needed to be able to safely eat, um, that's when we transition these babies to start feeding at the breast or feeding at a bottle. Um, and that's something that is challenging in the NICU for many different reasons because, you know, not all families can be there all the time, right? Um, Maybe families don't want to feed at the breast. Maybe they want to just pump um, or bottle feed. And um, there's a lot of staff or not staff. um, There's a lot of misperception that bottle feeding is easier for babies than breastfeeding in the NICU, which is not like by research, like we, we know that that's not true, but there is a lot of this like misconception out there or miss thing of people just want these babies to eat better and go home and, and worry about breastfeeding at home and fix that at home. And that's something I would hear all the time as a clinical nurse is like these babies would start to be good. They would be starting to eat and they still have a lot of challenges as they're learning to eat. So the goal is to get them home, right? So we want to want them to feed and go home. So we would focus on that. And you hear over and over from staff to parents of like, let's just feed them a bottle. They're taking a bottle better. Um, And then you can work on breastfeeding at home. You can go get help at home. And as a first nurse, like if you don't have breastfeeding experience, right. And you don't have that knowledge, like you don't realize how when these parents go home, they don't have that support. They don't have that. So these parents have goals for breastfeeding um, or breast pumping and, and feeding human milk. And they just, they're not meeting them because they go home and now they're you know, they have no supports. They can't get the baby to latch. They can't get the baby to take milk. And now they're in this whole world without the support of the NICU. Um, so my work in for my dissertation was looking at if we could see if there was a difference of babies who were feeding at breast in the NICU, um, if those parents met their breastfeeding goals. Um, so what we found is that babies who have their first oral feed at the breast versus at a bottle, um, it, these are breastfeeding babies. So if whether they had breastfeeding at the breast or breastfeeding in a bottle, like breast milk in a bottle, the babies who were put at the breast for their first, first feed were more likely to receive their, or more likely to meet their breastfeeding goals and have human milk at discharge and at three months um, and at six months after discharge. Mm. Um, so it's a really interesting thing. And it's funny because that area, I'm still in breastfeeding, obviously, right? Like human milk, it's my area, but I have, cha- I've changed in that some people don't see the connection. They're like, Oh, you just, you were looking at actually breastfeeding at the breast. And now I'm looking at components of human milk. Um, but to me, it really is the same in the sense you just have to flip the lens, right? Because if you're thinking of giving babies the most biologically optimized nutrition and um, source for them for growing and healing and development in the NICU, that's going to be freshly pumped, like as optimized milk as possible. At the breast is the most biologically normal of where the milk would be most bioactively similar to what it would be if they were at breastfeeding. Um, So when we think about getting babies feeding at breast, it's also about the components, right? Preserving that biologically optimized milk. Um, so 
that's where you kind of can bring the clinical in that if you're prioritizing at breastfeeding, you're actually prioritizing better milk in a sense, um, which is what I'm looking at now. That's very interesting. Is there something about the components of breast milk that degrade over time after it's been bottled that makes it like, what is the thing if there, if there are specific components that are separate from like bond pair bonding with the mother and Mm -hmm. the warmth of the skin and things like that, but like specific to the milk itself, it sounds like you're saying, is there something that degrades when it's been sitting in a bottle? Like, tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, there is. So that's one thing is a lot of times um, for people that aren't super familiar with human milk um, is that you think of it just as, you know, nutrition, right? It has the nutrition that babies need and it has immunological support. So immunity and nutrition is kind of like the basic of what people think of for breastfeeding and the benefits of it. But there are like hundreds, thousands of things in in human milk. Um, There's cells. um, So there are actually cells in milk that are there that with unknown significance at this point, there's all sorts of hypotheses of what they could be doing. Um, But as you can imagine, when there's cellular components in something that's, it's it's the living component, human milk is, there's stuff in it. Um, When you take that out of where it is and put it into say, you know, the refrigerator or the freezer, those things are gonna die. Um, The same thing is gonna happen to there's growth hormones, there's um, things like, um, um, Gosh, sorry, my my brain is <laughs> totally uh-huh. blanking here. Um, yeah, so there's there's growth hormones, there's all sorts of things in the human milk um, that can change, and there's varying degrees. There's different papers out there now where people are starting to look at this because they're realizing that things are changing. Um, some things don't change, like some the nutrition for the most part doesn't change. You don't have to worry about that too much, but it's more of the bioactive, like living things that are interacting with your cells as you're, you're ingesting the milk, um, that are the things that you're worried about. Like things like even like the pH can change, um, and all sorts of different, different components. It's hard. I feel like I could, sorry. No, no. What were you going to say? You feel like you could talk about No, I was going to say, I don't want to get into like the (laughs) the nerdy of all the things here that people are not going to know what they are. (laughs) But yeah, there are basically in a nutshell, there are things in milk that do change, um, with unknown significance of what that could mean for babies. Yeah, that's a, such a fascinating domain. It's something I've never really thought about. It's funny because my sister just had a baby and uh, I'm actually going to share this with her. So I'm sure she's going to be listening to this right now. But um, she has lots of questions for me that, you know, I, I mean, I'm a PICU nurse, so it's a little different mm-hmm. than being in the NICU, but we have NICU babies. and um, But I do get the same sentiment I think that you were alluding to earlier that like it's just easier to try to get them home bottle feed and stuff like this um and I just never really thought about the significant differences between being directly at the breast having it pumped still be breast milk but be refrigerated Mm -hmm. and then have a period of uh, delay between the time when it was pumped and being refrigerated to the time it's actually being received by the infant and then uh, at the other extreme, you know, formula based nutrition, it, which is really interesting to think through. Um, so I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, and the nerdy is good. We have a, a very eclectic group of listeners. Some of them are nursing students, which is great. Some of them are physicians and epidemiologists. And so there's all sorts of people who are actually appreciate your your technical knowledge. Too. Okay. <laughs> um, Can I Can I add a little bit more about milk that might be really interesting that if you don't know? So the other thing about human milk is that it's not like formula in a sense is it's the same thing, right? Like it's all the great things that babies need to grow and formula is great. Like it has a great need for it. Um, Human milk is really unique in the sense that it changes like throughout the day it changes. Like there's different, there's different hormones in it throughout the day. Things like, um, um, like melatonin and, um, related to sleep, like cortisol changes in the milk, things change throughout the day. Overnight, the milk is different. Um, Based on the sex of the baby that is born, the milk variation, milk is buried. Uh, Lots of different things, whether it's the first baby, it's your second baby. If you have an infection, if the baby has an infection, all these things can change from day one to day 30 to day 60 to day 90 to year two, whatever you are at your breastfeeding journey, the milk is always changing. So it's really incredible. Um, And person to person, it's different too. So it's really interesting. That is incredible. Um, And I assume there's also probably uh, burgeoning literature on like the 
impact of um, the microbiota in all of this as mm-hmm. well. Um, super interesting stuff. So let's back up for a second and okay. let's tell people what it is that your lab studies now. Uh, obviously, it's breast milk and components of breast milk and stuff is clearly a part of that, given your breadth of knowledge on this. But um, what is usually the elevator pitch you give people when they say, what do you study in your lab? <laughs> Yeah. So um, the biggest project that I have going on right now is I'm really trying to look at this like fresh milk versus stored milk. Mm. And let me just, I'll preface this saying this would not be in my elevator talk necessarily, (laughs) but that I just, if anyone's listening to this and they are, you know, have breastfed or they're planning to breastfeed or wherever they are in that journey, like there is no bad human milk. Like, I just want to say that, like, whether it's fresh, whether it's refrigerated, whether it's frozen, it is still beneficial. But the reason that I am focusing on it for the storage specifics is because when we have really immature babies, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26 week gestation infants who are so developmentally immature and have so much growth and so much risk and so much that they have to deal with in their growth and development and hospitalization, that's where this biologically optimized milk is I'm really focused on. So here's my elevator pitch. (laughs) So in the NICU, we have parents that are unable to, or we have babies that are unable to feed orally for whatever reason. Um, And we have parents who are giving human milk. And while we see great benefits of human milk for babies, whether you're preterm or full term, we know that human milk is has beneficial properties and benefits to child health, both short and long term. What we don't understand is why there's some variations, right? Like not every baby who has a hundred percent human milk diet is going to have the same great outcomes. Like there's going to be some variables. It's not a hundred percent protective. Um, so where that got me really thinking in my research is, well, what why is there such a variation, right? Like obviously there's Each baby is different, but like, why does human milk diet vary? And what I've found over the years is that the problem with human milk research is that whenever it's reported in the literature or wherever it's reported in, like, say, the hospital, it's being reported as any human milk. So that is, that's what that means is that if you're getting fresh milk at the breast, if you are getting freshly pumped milk in a tube, if you are getting refrigerated milk, if you are getting frozen milk, if you're getting pasteurized um, donor human milk, um, if you are wherever you are in the spectrum of milk, like as you can see, those types of milk all vary in like what they're going to have in them of potentially the bioactive components in them. It's never broken down like that in any of the research. Hmm. So that's, and it's a huge, like it's, it would be a huge undertaking to change that into like the governmental databases and to hospitals hospital databases to really tease that out. So my research is looking at trying to figure out, you know, from a science standpoint, can we figure out, are there differences? Can we figure out if fresh optimized milk, because we think that that would be the best, right? It sounds the best, but it's not clinically prioritized um, anywhere really in the world. Some places are doing it, but there's a lot of barriers also to feeding fresh milk. So until we have the data that says like, hey, this is really important, like we need to be prioritizing this for X, Y, and Z. Um, That's what I feel like we need that to really push if it needs to be done more um, commonly and more, I don't know, like more for people. Mm. That must be interesting as a component of your secondary analysis class. I'm sure you touch on the difficulty with secondary data in your area because that I can imagine that there are probably databases related to this but they all it sounds like from what you're saying they all cluster human milk Mm -hmm. as one thing as if it is one thing if it's one yeah Yeah. yep that's interesting that's exactly how it's done so it's really really challenging to like break out the you know outcomes and benefits and that but there are people that have started to look at this and they have found like from just comparing the data they have like of um, breastfeeding at the breast or breastfeeding in the bottle, there is a continuum of protection. So they are finding these results that babies who are getting at breastfeedings have less rates of um, like asthma and all those sorts of like things that we think of as breast milk being protective of. Um, they It's more protective than bottle feeding human milk, um, which is still more protective than formula feeding. But there is this continuum as you would start to, to think of for that. That's really interesting. So <clears throat> what um, types of research does your lab do? So you talked about the topic and kind of what you're focused on and why it's important. Um, so talk a little bit about your 
methods and approach rather? Like what, how do you study the things you study? Yeah. So I have a couple, a couple of different ways that I'm doing right now. Um, so right now for the specific project related to fresh milk, what we're doing is we're actually doing cell culture. So we are growing intestinal cells, um, and trying to make some clinical scenarios in these little petri dishes of clinical, of intestinal cells. <laughs> so we do cell culture. Um, we can also, we have a machine that does um, the macronutrients of breast milk. So we can measure like protein and calories and fat um, and carbohydrates of milk. Um, we also have a multiplexing machine. I don't know if you have um, are Say familiar again? with that. Like a multiplexing, it's called the MagPix, the one that I have. Okay. It's basically like an ELISA. Um, yeah. It's a way to run different like um, like hormones or um, cytokines, things like that, that you'd be interested in. Typically in the past, like if you do it from like a traditional ELISA standpoint, you can only do like one safe thing. Like say if you're looking at cortisol, you can only look at cortisol in a whole 96 well plate. Um, but this machine that I have has, um, it's countless. We have, we run like 15 at a time, but you can do way more than that. It's a multiplexer. So you can run all your analytes mm. together instead of having to run like 20 different plates to test 20 different things. You can run them all in the same plate and it's really neat. It really can help with data analysis in that way. That's really um, cool. Yeah. That's a, that's one of my, it's a neat machine. It's one that I'm like, I've kind of learned how to use and are still learning, but it's had a lot of, even more capability capabilities than I even know how to use right now. So it's exciting for the future of like continuing to figure out where I can put it in my research and figure out more things with it. Definitely. So it sounds like you're uh, a big component of the approach you take is looking through the lens of like biomarkers and, but you said something that intrigued me. You said you're trying to forgive me because I'm not going to say it right. Okay. Yeah. verbatim, but I think you said something like you're trying to recreate like a clinical scenario. Mm -hmm. um, say more about that because I'm not sure what you mean by that, but it sounds fascinating. Yeah. So um, basically what I'm doing for this project is we are trying to see if we can look at some sort of um, mechanism. So like I had mentioned, we know that milk, or we, we believe, right, that milk, there's a difference in fresh milk versus refrigerated versus frozen milk, um, that there probably is some differences because of the bioactive changes in those that they may have difference is in their protection for the infant. So one of the things that we know with human milk is that it's really good for the intestinal um, area for the GI development of babies. Um, so what I'm doing trying to kind of mirror a clinical scenario as much as you can, right, is I'm growing these intestinal cells. And what we're doing is we're adding um, fresh milk versus milk that's been refrigerated versus milk that's frozen. So they're all getting their own little experimental conditions. And then we're kind of um, make a sort of like infection happen um, to see that when in the presence of an infection, is there going to be a difference in how the protective abilities of milk, whether it's fresh, refrigerated, or frozen, it is going to change like the level of protection. Will there be more pro-inflammatory cytokines? Will there be more intestinal um, damage? Will there be less growth? Like all things like that. Um, so that's kind of how we're modeling what we could potentially be seeing in the NICU um, into the research lab. That's very cool. Um, it's uh, it's also timely too that I'm speaking to you about this. I had, we... Um, I have a pretty small PhD cohort at our institution for my cohort, uh, but we're pretty tight knit. And uh, interestingly, we're all very invested in theory and methodology. Um, and we had this at length discussion about when uh, a nurse doing nursing research is sort of foraying into doing like biochemistry. Mm -hmm. And you laid out this really interesting example of a way in which you could be doing bench research in the sort of traditional laboratory sense, but you're almost recreating a kind of clinical scenario that's directly relevant to your nursing care. Mm -hmm. um, do you agree with that? How do yeah, you that? I do. And I feel like that's like, it's interesting you're bringing it up because I feel like that's something, especially as I got into like the bench science that I would always hear from people like, well, how is that nursing research? Like, where is this nursing research? Like, you know, you're not a nurse anymore. And I'm like, no, I am. And I think that as a nurse in the research lab, we have the unique perspective and the unique like 
background, right? Like you, these intestinal cells to me, right, are not just intestinal cells. Like these are patients. These are people that I work with. Like I, I can see that connection to this, this cytokine that I'm looking at to this family, right? Like in the other room, like there's no, there. it's always there. Like I always have the patient focus. Like I always know what I'm doing and what it's for and how it's tied to human health. And I think that not everyone in the biological sciences, they don't, they don't have that perspective, right? You go to these conferences and you hear people talking about these experiments and you're like, okay, well, how is this going to help you? Like, how does this help a person? And there's no like connection there. Um, so I think for nursing, you definitely like I believe I, I'm a nurse in the lab, um, and I, I think that's where it's a really good strength to have to understand the clinical human background of a problem. Certainly, I also, and not to derail us particularly long, but I also think it's important too that um, you know, in the philosophy of science realm, um, people like Quine argued for holism, where he said that you kind of you can't look at an individual experiment to dictate whether the uh, enterprise is scientific. You look at the network of research, right? And if you look at your network of research over your whole career, let's say 30 years from now, presumably mm -hmm. you're going to expand on this and expand on this. And suddenly someday maybe you're, you know, you've started clinically and you're doing clinically informative work. And then all of a sudden, maybe later on, you're going back to being in the clinic again with your mm -hmm. research directly. So when you look at the whole network as if it's a node unto itself uh, as a unit, I feel like it's clear that it's nursing research. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, this is my my <laughs> bias. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I think it's important too, because one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on is I think for the nurse uh young nurses or nursing students listening kind of like in the beginning of their career, I think nurses think about research as just the stuff that I like to do, which is like statistics, mm -hmm. which they t tend to not like, and yeah. or that there's something like that limits us as nurses from being able to do work in the uh, sort of traditional laboratory mm -hmm. um, methods and approaches. But then they don't know about like the Jessica Gills doing TBI research with mm -hmm. neurons and culture at NIH or, you know, mm -hmm. the Joseph Pauli is doing, you know, like, and then the Carrie Ellen Breer is at UMass doing like, so tell us a little bit about when you realized that the bench work was what you were interested in. And um, what was it about that work that kind of gripped you? Yeah, so I've always like, been really interested in like, biological research. I did like college level courses in biology in high school, like continued to do it in college, but I never saw like I didn't at the time, I had no role models in nursing to see anyone doing the type of research that I didn't think was nursing, right? Like I, there were no nurses that I knew of in the time of my nursing school that were doing any sort of bench research. Um, so as I'm in my PhD program, I was doing my dissertation. I'm like, okay, what am I doing next? Like, this is not what I want to do. Like, I love breastfeeding research. And I'm really passionate about that, but I'm really interested in like this lab research that I have not touched in years now because I didn't do any of it in my PhD program. So I feel like I had a little bit of a dis disadvantage in the fact that I feel like there's a lot more models now of like people all over, right, of like nurses doing this type of research. It's more talked about. There's just more out there. Um, so you can potentially do it during your under or during your PhD program and continue to get experience where I got my first lab experience in my postdoc. Um, but to me, I just love the science. And I think as I was reflecting on that, I was lucky that I had a really good mentor who when I, I told her, you know, I was like, you know, I'm getting ready to graduate. I don't think I want to do this. Like I, I'm really interested in lab research um, because the other the reason where I kind of started to think of that in my PhD program, Ian, is that during my PhD program, I changed from my clinical nursing role into a research um, coordinator for the NICU. So oh. I started to have experience working with pharmaceutical companies. I was working on clinical trials. I was working with the physicians in their research. And one of the physicians at um, Connecticut Children's, well, a lot of the physicians that were doing research, but one of the ones that I had worked with, who was one of my mentors, he was doing really lab-based research. And I was very fascinated by it, intrigued. And I was like, wow, I can't, you know, I wish I could do this. So I had told one of my nursing mentors and she was like, as any great mentor would do, she's like, Look, we're going to figure this out for you. And she really helped me. She was a really great mentor who really helped push me forward and helped me make those connections. Um, 
And that's kind of how I got into it was really, yeah, I would never have known during my PhD, that's where I'd end up. But by the end of my program, that's kind of how I fell into the sciences of that part. That's fantastic. Um, so we've talked a lot about like how you started and kind of what um, drew you into this area and mm -hmm. what your current work is. Is there like an ultimate question that you're trying to answer kind of at the end of the road? I know that's a little vague and maybe too big to answer, but is there like a primary problem you're trying to solve ultimately with your entire research enterprise? I think in general, for me, it's really like improving health and development, like both short and long term for premature babies. And like, there's a huge amount of research, like obviously human milk is not the only thing that is going to help with that. Like it's a huge spectrum of things that can help. But for me, I just see that as like one of the biological areas that really could make an impact for, for this infant human health, like from the day they're born until, you know, they're a hundred years old. Um, so that's, I guess my big, big picture question is just like improving health. Um, and then I'm kind of like a tiny niche down in that. <laughs> That's cool. Um, uh, you know, I'm still resonating with the whole concept of, you know, a premature baby probably is going to be more dramatically affected. I'm not saying that um, a term baby who is born without some of these difficulties mm -hmm. wouldn't be benefited by this, but just like the distance between like developmental distance between them and how much the premature infants likely to be impacted by just like, did they get direct to breast milk or did they get refrigerated milk? And mm -hmm. obviously to recapitulate your point from earlier, yeah. still healthy, still, you know, yes. optimal nutrition, but yeah. there are certain bioactive agents you're not necessarily going to get. And I imagine, you know, it's akin to like, this is a weird analogy, but you know, if I, an adult am exposed to like a teratogen, it's not going to impact me like it would if I was an embryo, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, like mm -hmm. there is a certain phase of development where there's diminishing returns and, or yes. where the return is massive. And I feel like you've identified this place where the return on investment here is potentially huge. Um, what are the other areas that you think would be really interest? You know, I guess what I'm asking is like, are you interested primarily in like brain development or immunity or like, um, are you interested in specific elements of premature infant health or development or? Yeah, I feel like I, um, I, it's bad to say it right that I'm interested in everything. <laughs> um, the, the what kind of the next stage of my research is I'm going to be looking more in an animal model and be looking more of the whole body systems. And I'm really interested specifically for babies because like the main things that are really important, right, are well, a lot of really important things. But with our babies, their brains, their intestines, um, their lungs and their hearts are like obviously the major things that are that need support. Um, for me, the intestines are like that first right. Like we see that's where the food's going at first. Like it's gonna it's hit there. So that's kind of my first look at that. Mm. Um, but long term brain is something I'm really interested in as well. Um, and the other organs. But that's those are my two kind of big ones right now is the the, the intestines, um, like the gut area and the and the brains. Certainly. I have a, a friend of mine who um, I've never worked with uh, in research specifically, but um, who I've known from my personal life, who is an aging researcher at Brown. And it's funny, I feel like the development researchers, I don't know if you'd categorize yourself, yourself as a development researcher per se, but like, if you'll allow me to categorize you for a moment as a mm -hmm. nursing researcher who is interested in de human development um, and breast milk, he's interested in the aging portion kind of on the other end of the lifespan and how to extend lifespan and health span. And he studies um, mice, he studies newts and he studies flies. And in all of those models, there's been, and he, of course he's, he's older, so he's had a long time to do this, but like he's studied, you know, the aldosterone system. He's studied the cardiorespiratory system. Like, so I feel like it's actually not that strange for you on kind of the similar spectrum, but on the development end to think about like, mm -hmm. how is this affecting the gut? How is this affecting the brain? Um, so I think that's really cool, actually. Thanks. So um, 
one thing I'd like to ask you, and you know, the podcast, it's kind of evolved over time, to, you know, broadly related to nursing research. And but it, my core interests are in theory and methodology. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I am very interested in methodological methodological struggles that nurse scientists are coming up with in their respective areas, whether or not it's their struggle or a mm-hmm. challenge that they see in their area of expertise. Are there methodological kind of difficulties in your area that you see that you think would be interesting if somebody were to um, kind of sort that out? And what would those be for you? That's a great question. Um, I don't know if I'm going to overthink this. <laughs> Uh, like, do you mean like in, like actually in the lab part sure. of methodology or yeah, it, like, it doesn't have to be like, um, you know, people are trying to use this statistical technique and it's not working out so well, or they're trying to infer causality from whatever, just any methodological thing, whether it's a laboratory approach or an analytic approach or a study design thing that you're seeing that needs to be improved upon. Um, yeah, kind of I think anything. Oh, sorry. No, no, that's right. Um, Honestly, looking in the big picture, I think kind of what I've already mentioned before about how human milk research is reported so differently, I think that that methodologically really needs to be fixed. Like the variation of you probably see it in your area too is like when people are writing up their results, like some teams talk about it like this and some teams talk about it like that. And some teams got something at, you know, day two and some other teams got it at day 10 and their other teams are year two and they're all talking about it at the same time. But like all these points of human milk are so different. Like there's lots of things that can make it vary. And without this like standardized definition of what we're even talking about, it makes it really hard to understand and really hard to kind of get those answers. So I think methodologically, like a standardization of classifying human milk, the type of human milk and like the age of human milk, if that makes sense, because as I mentioned before, like milk changes day to day. And that's another issue with like fresh and frozen milk is when you're having frozen milk, you're giving milk from maybe two months ago now to a baby that's now, you know, it was made for that time and now it's this time, which is still good, but maybe it's not, you know, the best biologically at that time. Um, so I think really having a standardized way to report human milk feeding would help in um, outcomes data and just anything related to human milk feeding research. That'd be really interesting. I'm smiling because there there is something analogous with respect to my work. I don't want to bore my listeners too much, but if you're if you're interested, um, I being the methodological nerd that I am, I'm interested in studying clinical epidemiology with respect to pain, and I'm interested in pain disparities in specifically sexual and gender minorities. Okay. And there's a host of literature on different pain disparities from chronic pelvic pain to migraines to you know chest pain and all sorts of other things. And nobody really knows why that disparity Mm -hmm. exists. And it's because, in part, it's because there are these large epidemiologic studies that ask about chronic pain that never ask about someone's sexuality or gender identity beyond biological sex. And of course, biological sex is important, but Mm -hmm. there's no breakdown of the clusters of different uh, individual identities. And, And yet there is research that shows it's important. Um, Mm -hmm. Bisexual women have a four times greater risk of chronic pelvic pain than straight women. Mm -hmm. And we can't answer the question why that is, because these larger studies are not asking about these specific subgroups. Yeah, And then even within them, NIH clusters sexual and gender minorities as SGM as if it's one group, but within it, you have (laughs) lesbians, gays, bisexuals, transgender, you know, and so you have this cohort that's being lumped together, but our experiences are very vastly different in some cases. Mm -hmm. Um, So I do, it's almost like there's this analogous difficulty with respect to like, how do you disaggregate those clusters of data that are all clumped together? And maybe you can't do it with what exists potentially, but for future data collection, like encouraging people to think about, you know, was this milk uh, for, you know, flash frozen and kept for two months and then fed to this baby? Like Mm -hmm. that's important. Those are important data. Yeah. Um, to be able to to answer some of those questions that you're interested in. Yeah, definitely. Um, what is your next, like, how is the work you're doing now going to feed into the next project? Um, I think it's probably reasonable for somebody to kind of infer a little bit, but like, 
um, tell us a little bit about your your goal for af- your because you're K23. Is it that you mm-hmm. have? Yeah. Congratulations, by the way. Yeah, thanks. Um, after your K23, what's that next? Is it an R01 type thing you're trying to go for? And if so, like, what is your next project ideally? Oh, I feel like that's the question of the day. <laughs> I feel like that's something I, I'm still so interested in so many things. It's hard to kind of focus. <laughs> Um, but my, my big thing is like trying to really get this information of like what's happening, um, with milk. And then I really want to get more into mechanism. So like understanding how, like we know that human milk is beneficial and we're starting to understand that some of the components might be tied to different health outcomes, but I'm really interested in like knowing more about like exactly like which ones are, um, and how they are. Because the other thing with human milk too, is that, it's been studied over the years of like, I'm looking at macronutrients and I'm looking at micronutrients and I'm looking at this and I'm looking at cells and I'm looking at microbiome and all these teams are doing different things. But in reality, like human milk's not just human milk with microbiome, like it's microbiome with the micronutrients and with the hormones and with the cytokines and all these things together. And that's where the NIH too has started talking about they want us to be looking at it in a systems perspective. So Mm. that's something I'm really interested in too, is starting to really understand like not only like what are these level of things and how are they impacting babies, but like how are they working together and how is that even, you know, where does that factor come in, which makes it even more complex and so confusing and and overwhelming because it's just another thing to think about. Um, But that's like my next question is I'm really looking more for mechanism um, and to really understand milk um from a bigger perspective for infant health there i feel like i can hear uh yvette conley in the back of my mind about how interesting the overlap is here with what you're saying and um an offshoot looking at like multi-omics work in Mm -hmm. a growing infant um so it seems like there's lots of really interesting things that you could do from here yeah is there a particular mechanism that kind of grips you more than others that you think you'd be inclined to I mean, I know I'm putting you on the spot, so no worries, but yeah, if no. you don't have one in mind. But is there something that comes up to mind for you that you are particularly passionate about? I feel like where my research started with, I was really interested in cells and human milk and what these things at the time we were calling them stem cells or stem-like cells. And there's some, I don't want to call them necessarily that right now, just because it's there's some stuff out there in, in the literature and in the research world that's not really calling them stem cells or stem-like cells. Um, but cells are really interesting to me. And um, chimerism, I hope I'm saying that right, because I always read it and I never hear it being said. Right but basically, <laughs> basically, when um, when someone is pregnant, right, we know that when a fetus is being developed, there's sharing of like maternal um components to baby components and back and forth. And um, that's a normal process. Like that's there. And what has been shown in the literature a little bit and through animal work is that once babies are born, um, that breast milk might be that also that chimerism where some of the mom cells are getting into the baby and doing things and who knows why. And, and there was some work out there that said in the animal model, they were finding, um, you know, mom's cells from milk in as functioning cells in li- the liver and the brain um, of the mouse pups. They, they were um, cross fostered. So it wasn't, they weren't cells that were given during pregnancy. So they knew that these cells from the mom were only given during lactation. Um, so I'm really interested in like why, there is that chimerism or like, why are these maternal cells going into the infant? Is there a purpose for it? Probably right. Biologically, you would think that if something's happening, there's probably a reason. Um, I'm a big believer in that. If like biologically, just because we don't understand it yet, doesn't mean that there's not a purpose for it. So that's something I'm really interested in is learning more about the communication between mom and baby um, through lactation, um, through cells, but not necessarily just cells, like through many different things of like why, how we're signaling to our babies, like how the world is, right? And how they're growing and how to do all those things. So that's something I'm kind of see as the next. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, and I like, I especially like the point you make about how sometimes we, I, I and forgive me if I'm taking this too far, but the way that I internalize this is like, sometimes as scientists, we take 
nature and the world and you know or some experience in it and we try to decompose it and then mm -hmm. put things back together with the the component parts that we understand from our model but the thing about models is that they're always overly simplified versions mm -hmm. of the bigger picture and so you're sort of speaking to this really integral point about like we need to um think about the the entire picture the whole story it all goes together mm -hmm. for a reason and these components they existed to begin with for presumably for a functional purpose it evolved for a reason i guess is how i heard it yeah um so i think that's very interesting it has been very wonderful to talk to you and i know we're coming up on time so i just want to ask uh two more quick questions if i can yes. firstly um what advice do you have for people who are interested in whether it's the topical area that you're interested in or mm -hmm. the approach you're interested in specifically thinking about you know fledgling nurse researchers mm -hmm. what advice do you have for them i would say if you're interested in something try to find mentors in that area and not necessarily in like say science but someone who's gonna like fight for you because i will tell you like at the beginning of my science area like in my postdoc when i was doing this research with human milk and looking at cells i got a lot of comments of that's not going to work there's no point of that like what why are you doing that like this is not whatever um but i really believed in it and i had people who helped me continue to believe in myself um so i would just say if you have an idea that you're really interested in that don't let someone who's even a senior super scientist right who's telling you that it's not going to work um stop you from pursuing it because there, it, it could. And, and what happened with mine is like what people were telling me was never going to work. It wasn't going to be. It's now in the literature, it's known like that these things can be done. They can happen. So I'm really glad, you know, however many years ago that I didn't say, oh, you're right. Like if this person said that, that's not a good area of science. Um, so I'd say like stick with your gut and just keep learning and, and being open to changes. Um, and just to clarify, Ian, you ask for questions like on career, right? My brain is yeah. going. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and I guess my other qu thing would be is to be looking for the right opportunities because obviously you don't want to say yes to everything, but you also don't want to say no to everything. You want to have the right no so that you can say yes to the right yeses. Um, and don't let things that scare you stop you from doing them because I have definitely grown in the moments that I've done something that's really scary, like presented at a conference I didn't want to go to. And then um, because I was so afraid of what would happen. Right. And then it was something that led me to connections that led me to a job or led me to um, connections for a grant collaboration and things like that. So be willing to kind of step out there, put yourself on the edge and, and go for it because if you stay comfortable, you're probably not going to grow. <laughs> so definitely uh, push yourself even though it's scary. Yeah, there are a lot of good nuggets in there. I mean, you can't grow without a little bit of uh, adversity to be able to um, to develop. Mm -hmm. um, I It really resonates with me, the idea that, like, at, at, and I talk about this with uh, colleagues all the time, especially as we think about, like, newer PhD students who are just starting and who are anxious. And so they're either saying uh, no to things because they're nervous, like, you know, mm -hmm. the point about the going to a conference that you're not sure about. But mm -hmm. then there are lots of people who, I think this is a problem specifically for grad students, they'll say yes to way too many things. Yeah. And the hard part as a student is you don't know what things you should say no to and what things you shouldn't. But I think that that speaks to your earlier point too, of having a really strong mentor who can help guide you. Yeah. Um, because sometimes... Um, if you don't know what you really shouldn't prioritize because it's mm -hmm. going to take you off of some track that you're on, sometimes it takes that objective kind of third party to go, it strikes me that this is your trajectory and is this serving that? I'm not really sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that will resonate with folks a lot. Um, did we miss anything big or is there anything about your topic area that you want to say to folks before we close out the podcast? Um, not that I can think of. I just, I feel like I probably didn't give like super specifics. So if anyone's interested in talking more about human milk, like I'd love to, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm not sure if you'll have my email or anything here, but I'd be happy to talk and give insights and um, yeah, good luck. Awesome. 
Carrie, Ellen, thank you so much for the time today. It's been really nice to talk to you. Yeah, nice to talk to you too. Thanks so much.